Mini episode 381 of the FDH Lounge is brought to you by Sportsology, delivering unconventional columns and webcasts about sports, TV, music, movies, and more. Follow them on the web at sportsology.info. The FDH Lounge. You want to schedule your life around it. A long time ago, on a gloomy, wet Cleveland spring night, two men stand alone amidst the late night drizzle. Their voices echo across the vacant station parking lot as they debate the merits of the great American radio show that have been missing for far too long. On that night, an idea was born. That idea became the FDH Lounge. Welcome to the FDH Lounge. Welcome to FDH Lounge, mini-episode number 381. This is FDH Managing Partner Rick Morris welcoming you to the show where nothing is off topic. We love to talk sports on this show, as we will be doing today, but so much of what we'll be talking about with this gentleman revolves around leadership and how it has applied to his career, past, present, and future. He is a five-time Pro Bowl cornerback. He won multiple leadership awards during his career, the Walter Payton Award, Byron Wizard White, and Bart Starr. He has served as president of the NFLPA and is presently the Senior Vice President of NFL Player Engagement. And again, somebody who I can say personally I appreciated watching a lot uh, as a player. He was a great player for one of my favorite teams, the Miami Dolphins. I've mentioned on the show previously that, yes, I am a lifelong resident of America's North Coast. So first and foremost, a Browns fan, but the Dolphins are my 1B team. And he was there for the last great chapter of the Don Shula years. So uh, it's a true pleasure to be speaking to this gentleman. I can only be speaking of the one and only Troy Vincent. Troy, welcome to the FDH Lounge, sir. It's a pleasure to have you on today. How are you? Well, good. Thanks for having me this evening. Well, thank you for being here. We uh, appreciate the chance to have a conversation with you. Uh, again, we were uh, fortunate to be able to uh, make a connection with you there during uh, Super Bowl week. That was how it got set up. And uh, so I guess I'll start there. Your your thoughts on Super Bowl week, what it was like in the New York, New Jersey area. Everyone was making a big deal out of it, of, of how much different it was going to be, not merely because it was in uh, a cold weather climate, but uh, again, New York, the capital of seemingly everything in the world, financial, media, otherwise. What were your thoughts on the whirlwind that was last week? Well, I, actually, I had a good time. And being a Northeastener, it was it was fun. It was nothing new to weather. I think a week the, the week prior when we had the big snow dump, a little bit of concern on could this happen again next week. And just throughout the week, the city, I've mentioned this to several people, the city was so much going on all the time. There was, they're really up to maybe Saturday. You'd really, you couldn't feel the Super Bowl. You just didn't feel the presence of the Super Bowl like we see when we're in New Orleans and in Florida and Arizona. But I felt overall, I mean, you couldn't ask for better better conditions. It's football season. Um, it's the Super Bowl. Players will adjust. I thought that the fans that, that were there, I thought they, they enjoyed themselves the day of the game. I thought the festivities throughout the week um, was engaging for both the young audience, the mature audience, so there was enough to do. If you didn't like the Super Bowl festivities, then you could go some other place around town and still have some fun. That's a very interesting critique, and I've heard that from other people, that no single event, it seems like, can overwhelm New York City. So, yeah, that uh, it was possible to almost maybe even forget at times that it was Super Bowl week there because there's always so much going on uh, in there. It's very interesting that you mentioned that. Do you get the sense that, again, the weather played uh, its part on Sunday by being as mild as I think could have been expected for the circumstances. I, I, Do you get the sense that I all think, things considered, they earned a chance to get another Super Bowl? I would, I would say, based off of what we saw, why not? I think the commissioner alluded to that in his press conference uh, this past Friday, and I think some of the post-game comments. It was 50 degrees, 45, 50 degrees, and. You know, by the end of the game, well, 35, 40, that's good football weather. You know, growing up in, in Jersey, playing ball in Lower Bucks County, going out to Madison, Wisconsin, now that's cold. And, you mm-hmm. know, and then going up to Buffalo, it, it was good football weather. And I think any of the – any city, you know, some, especially some of the cities that are doing some new renovations on the stadium, Philly included, um, you have to say, hey, will this return here? You know, what went wrong, what didn't work? 
you look at uh, Philadelphia, obviously Detroit has a, a dome, so that's a little bit different. Minnesota, they have a dome, but why not? Um, and I, I think the commissioner and those Super Bowl committees, the owners in the Super Bowl committees, I think this experience here in New York said that, hey, we can do it and we can pull it off. Well, that was the impression I got from afar, certainly. That was the same thing I think that a lot of people thought from afar. And, uh, again, uh, the temperature even a little bit worse uh, for that uh, one Super Bowl down at the Tulane Stadium in New Orleans all those years ago. So you never can quite tell what's going to happen with that. Uh, as, as far as the game goes, I'd like to get your opinion here and kind of break a tie as far as a difference of opinion that we've had uh, internally here. I, on Twitter on Sunday night, uh, somebody that uh, we've had an association with uh, previously, uh, Corey Benini, editor of KFFL, took issue with my assessment of the game that if you played the game a thousand times, you might get that extreme of an outcome maybe once. And I say that as somebody who picked Seattle and who's one of the very few who picked Denver to, to be under 20 points all year, or for the first time all year. So I'm not saying that part of it was a fluke, but the extreme – nature of it and as, as, as rattled and out of their skin as Denver looked from start to finish. Do you agree with me that that would probably not replicate itself too many times if you played that game that many times over, or do you think it was close to showing the difference between the two teams as it really existed? I, I think it relates to who they are and going into the game. I actually thought we wanted to see a really good football game just because of the offensive machine and the productivity that we saw with Peyton in that offense all year long. And as my, my wife and I, we were watching the game one Sunday. After the first quarter, I said, I look over to her and I go, you know what, this reminds me of Evander Holyfield and Mike Tyson. She goes, what? I go, a boxer will always be the puncher. And Everybody say everybody meets their match, and it's one of those matchups where they they just they have your number. A Vander Holyfield could have fought Mike Tyson, or Mike Tyson could have fought Vander Holyfield twenty times. We were going to see the same outcome. It was just style. That style just it, it just countered what we saw all, all year long. That's very interesting. I, I, I certainly haven't heard anybody make the Holyfield uh, Tyson comparison to that, and uh, a little bit counterintuitive because on the surface you would look at it and you would say, "Well, Seattle, what their style of play is like Tyson." But I see what you're saying here is that Tyson was vulnerable to the kind of fighter that Holyfield was. And for Denver, we were talking about this last week on on the show with our uh, celebrity guest analyst Lex Luger. He made a great point leading up to this about rhythm, and isn't that such a key thing for something like? Like Denver, they're unbeatable when they're in rhythm. When they got it all going on, you can't stop them. But you need to disrupt it. And you seem to be saying, if I'm reading you right, that Seattle plays exactly the right kind of game to throw them completely out of the Exactly. Culture. And on any, you can play that game on Monday because you saw it for four quarters. And there was nothing that the Denver Broncos could do to counter, which told you it's that, that style. And the players – it just it was it was kind of that it was that David and Goliath, and I, I'm going to keep because we always talk about as you develop athletes, you talk about develop skill always beats talent, but when you have skill and talent, that's a very difficult combination to beat. Decker, the West Wall, they were literally they were they were faceless objects during that time. And you saw the first Chandler tackle, it set the first play, go, oh, my gosh. And then you saw that first series. You saw that every blow was a knockout blow, and they weren't backing up. They were aggressive. The officials were allowing them to play. And there was, you know, Peyton was a little, you know, a little rattled. And, you know, they were, you know, Russell on the other side, ball-controlled offense, and they just kept chipping and chipping. You go, well, two points is not enough to beat Peyton. Uh, five points is not enough to beat him. Eight points is not enough. Well, 15 points is definitely not enough to beat him. And then you just saw him just start chipping away, chipping away, then time start running out. Before you know it, it was 30, 35 or whatever. Well, you know what it kind of reminded me of also in terms of a, a, an unlikely team getting 40 points in a Super Bowl 
like that. It almost, not to bring up any bad memories here, but the Tampa Bay-Oakland Super Bowl, and maybe not that bad of a memory because you guys actually looked a lot better against Tampa Bay in the NFC Championship game than the Raiders did there. But did it, did it restore any comparisons in your mind as far as how that went? Because that, that Bucks team is not somebody you think would drop a 40 bomb on anybody. But uh, they're, they're, it, it played out exactly the same way as, how, as far as how they disrupted Rich Gannon well, well, and what has been an unstoppable Oakland offense. It, it, it did, and what happens, when you score defensively, they had two defensive touchdowns or the safety, mm-hmm. and then they had the intercept. When you're scoring defensively, it's a long day. The probability of you winning that game increases tremendously. And they were just clicking on all cylinders, offense. And that's typically a coach is saying, we got to win two or three phases of the football game, whether it's offense, defense, defense, special team. They won all three phases of the game, special teams, offense, and defense. You can't win if you lose all three phases of the game. Well, it's funny, Troy, because I was putting the question to people on air and off air prior to the Super Bowl in terms of – because my philosophy is always when you have mega strength on mega strength, that the third best unit a lot of times is going to decide the game. So that was my question to people. Who's going to be the third best unit – the Seattle offense or the Denver defense, it turns out that uh, Seattle's offense and defense were number one and number two in whatever order, and uh, Denver's, def- uh, Denver's offense might have been fourth out of the four uh, when you look at it there. Their defense really didn't have a chance in some of the spots they were in. The, the, for, for Seattle to have dominated on both sides of the ball like that, I, I think is just what makes everybody come away shaking their heads because you know even for those of us who picked Seattle to win, that's the part none of us saw coming. That's right, and, and I, I mean, it's those who did pick, they, they just felt like, hey, timing, they were hitting their stride at the right time, good defense, defense going, defense, good defenses win Super Bowls. But I don't think any of us, and I, I'm the first to admit, just the way Peyton has played all year long, and I'm, I'm one for the, as we would say, the old heads. I, I would never, and I would have never thought that that offense um, would have generated less than 15 points. I, I, that's as sat at the biggest stage, uh, the, you know, the biggest game of the, the season, I just – but, hey, I've been on the other side of that, not in the Super Bowl. And um, it's it's not a good feeling. And the best team – hey, the best team won this Sunday. Oh, they certainly did. No question about that. And as far as – I'm glad you mentioned about uh, old heads there because I want to ask you a question. I, I don't know how this – uh, is going to be read by, by old heads and about uh, maybe this generation of players, maybe they would look at it a little bit differently. But starting to get some word out of uh, Denver, I guess TMZ was reporting about Von Miller, I, I guess, uh, trying to get into a Super Bowl party on Sunday night, supposedly that uh, there were a lot of Seattle players at. And uh, he's taking a real wrapping for that. I, I had heard this afternoon on Denver Talk Radio as, as far as, leaving a bad taste in people's mouths. I mean, what would be your thought on something like that? Is that the kind of thing that's harmless fraternization or, or something like that that people do you think might have a right to take umbrage to? Well, I mean, actually, it's the first I've actually heard it. Um, okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm literally clueless of the subject or what actually what, you, what transpired outside of you just sharing that with me. Sure. Uh, hope that that's not the case. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Sunday night after a game, whether you're on a winning team or losing team, um, game's over, and, you know, people are out enjoying themselves. That's absolutely true. Yeah, you're going to have that, especially in a place like the greater uh, New York area. And, yeah, it's uh, right now it's just a TMZ report. Don't know if it's been substantiated, but, uh, yeah, that was just something that really kind of piqued my interest when I saw it. I mean, another thing that's very much uh, hitting the transom today as we're having this conversation and as we start to segue towards this, this proposed uh, early intervention program that you in your capacity as senior VP of NFL player engagement putting out there. As I understand it, uh, the core objective of it would be to help uh, at-risk prospects before they get into the league to basically maximize their chances of success, minimize their chances of being in trouble. Is, is that a pretty fair yes, representation? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, okay. sir. And that's, that's, that's the objective. It's, it's an intervention. Um, intervention program is, is the way we have we've discussed it. You know, how do we you know, daily, my daily responsibility as it pertains to, to, to all personnel is how do we develop people? And in this particular case, when we look at the athlete, and oftentimes sport itself enables us as athletes. I'm a former athlete, 
but I know sport, the things that I've done in sport, if I would have done it, it, it just being a normal individual, um, I am recommended behind it. You know, there's uh, costly penalties, but there are things that we've either experienced throughout our lifetime in high school, middle school, college, that we've never really addressed. And we're talking about the total wellness of the athlete, the long-term effects of relationships, emotional and psychological effects. So we want to be able to address and make sure that people are getting proper treatment, proper counseling, and they're addressing things that never had been addressed during their, during their growth. So an early intervention program is, 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 you know, we've been in constant dialogue internally, all parties, on how do we assist the athlete as he transitions into the game. That makes a lot of sense, that, that old saying about an ounce of prevention, and it sure sounds like it would be uh, applicable uh, in these circumstances here. And You must be somebody with a very unique perspective uh, on, on these matters and, and what players are going through because it, it's very interesting to me that uh, your son, Troy Vincent, Jr., a star prospect, uh, from what I understand, headed to North Carolina State next year, even playing the same position as you, cornerback. And uh, he is somebody that, uh, actually a very good friend of our show, uh, former NFL punt returner Vernon Turner, uh, was doing some coaching down at the Blue Gray game down in Tampa a couple weeks ago. And uh, he came away very, very impressed with your son, saying great things about him. And that backs up everything that I've read independently. So for, for something like this, I'm just curious, I mean, in terms of anything that you're – willing to share publicly, whether it be uh, positional advice on playing cornerback, life advice on being a star athlete. What, what are some of the core things that you've tried to implant in your son? Because uh, clearly everything seems to be going very well. Well, it's work in progress. And as I share with Troy, as he's an athlete. He's my oldest boy. Um, we're work in progress. Uh, we've never arrived. It's never as good as it feels and it's never as bad as you think it is. And I have an older daughter, um, and, and, you know, Troy will be signing his letter of intent to NC State tomorrow. And, and, and frankly, we spend most of our time talking about what can we do to be part of the solution. You know, sport is a byproduct of everything else that we do. You know, God has granted him, granted me with some abilities, and some talent. But what can we do? How do we become better people? We talk about, we have these discussions daily about the importance of academic success, not athletic success, the importance of giving back to the community, the importance of being responsible. We talked about the EIP just, you know, just a few seconds ago, but we all sharing on a responsibility of maintaining and preserving our game, developing our future. Well, also there's a personal accountability. So, Troy, Troy's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, it's a constant battle for me as I've raised him in the 21st century as an athlete on what he sees. As athletes, we know what we can be by what we see. I hope, I pray each day that I'm a good example for him, but the reality is he still has to go out to the general public. And there's conversations that take place. There's things that take place in our local communities on a daily basis that it's just hope that the things that we've instilled in our in him or in our in our children, my wife's and I's children, that that they take heed to him and they make good decisions and choices, decisions and consequences. And decisions that he makes today will impact him for the rest of his life. The NFL, the NBA, your financial future is not in professional sports. Your financial future is in your ability to read, to write, to comprehend we talk about maintaining positive relationships. You get married, you want to be able to sustain your family. How do you do that? When, you're, when, you, when you remove yourself, when you graduate from college, when you're, you're, you're doing an interview, we don't, we don't, you didn't grow up with tattoos all up your body, earrings, and, and hey, let's, let's, let's look like respectable people. And um, So those are the little things that we talk about are the little life lessons that we hope to transfer those things that we learn in football, the values of football that we can take into real life. And just hoping that, you know, that he makes the right decisions um, that will allow him to be a better individual once he leaves North Carolina State. 
Absolutely. And the, the one thing I gleaned from that that seems to be really kind of at the core of, of many of those disparate points there, uh, I think it's a wonderful point uh, about how really we are all works in progress. I think that's a tremendous thing because it, it's a leveling effect, is it not? It keeps you from getting too high or too low. There's always tomorrow. There's always the chance to set things right if things aren't going wrong, if things are going you know, so great that you're you're tempted to maybe get a little bit carried away with yourself. It, it makes you think, it, you know, you have to keep proving it. You have to keep getting it done. That's an excellent point right there, I think, Troy. And, and I learned that. I learned that. I was taught. And we talk about leadership. All leaders have once been led. You know, so all your great leaders at, at some point in time, they were led by another leader. And I, uh, uh, Reggie White, close friend of mine, Aeneas Williams, I never forget my first Pro Bowl. We were sitting in the locker room, and he shares with me before we went out to practice. He says, the one thing that you can't, uh, you know, the one thing that I want you to remember, you never read your clips. Never read the clips, whether you play good or you think you play poorly. Because if you read it, Troy, you'll begin to believe. And when you start believing those things, it changes who you are. And now you live a life of an emotional roller coaster based off of what someone else has said about you. You know, sometimes as parents, I don't want to be a helicopter uh, mother, a father, and neither does my wife want to be a helicopter. But an 18-year-old doesn't know what he doesn't know. And the last thing we're going to do is allow someone to come in our home and share with my son something that we know isn't true. So 18-year-olds make 18-year-old decisions. So we've got to constantly keep our thumb on him and constantly be a reminder that life's, life's about serving other people. Life's about what can you do for someone else. You'll get your rewards, you'll win, but what have you done for someone else? And that's what we talk about all the time. And we use examples every day on television when we see crisis, uh, when we see domestic disputes, let's talk about it with all of my children. Let's talk about that. What would, what would you do here? Why do you think this individual took this stance? What stance would you take? If you see this happening, would you call 911? But just having healthy conversations around real-life issues and life challenges, because sport, we say sport takes care of itself. And you got a bunch of people lining up to, to take part in developing you as an athlete. But it's important for us because we don't want to. Me and my wife, we talk about this all the time. Man, the last thing we want to do is to, to turn over a risk to someone. We don't want to develop and, and, and raise up a risk to society. Absolutely. that is. I can see where that is something that would be uh, you know, the, the foremost thing that you want to avoid in life. And uh, fortunately, as you've said, uh, so far so good on that, and I'm sure that will continue to be the case. It's very interesting you mentioned Reggie White and Aeneas Williams there because you, you, without meaning to, you almost uh, kind of anticipated where I wanted to go next in terms of asking you about leadership and, and leadership role models. And this, I'm calling this the Harvey Schiller question because when we had Dr. Schiller on the show, in seven years, out of all the guests that we've had, he's the only person I ever thought to ask this of, and you're the second person because I look at some of the influences that you've had. For him, he'd worked under uh, General Curtis LeMay, Ted Turner, George Steinbrenner, work, worked with Billy Payne, Eric Bischoff. So he had a lot of figures that were uh, very strong-willed and that really kind of taught him a lot. And I asked him a little bit about that. I'm going to pose the same question to you because you know, just in terms of the more prominent names, Don Shula, Andy Reid, Joe Gibbs, a uh, cup of coffee in the off season with Jimmy Johnson before he signed with Philadelphia. So, you know, and I'm sure there's, um, you know, quite a lot of others that have made an impact on you as well. Barry Alvarez, a name that I hadn't thought to put to the list until now. So, what are some of the things that you've picked up from these gentlemen, and are there any kind of common traits that you've seen among them? Yes, well, one, you name the obvious. You name the more recognizable faces. But I would say, you know, my grandfather, who was a World War II vet, Jefferson Vincent, you know, my mother, uh, James and Linda Bolly, who were my guardians as I attended Pensbury High School, James, Jim Dundella, who was my high school head. I learned more from Jim Dundella than I learned from any coach the real values of football, who was my high school coach at Pensbury High School there in Lower Bucks County. But the visible, when you talk about Don Shula, uh, Joe Gibbs, we're talking about Hall of Fame coaches and Hall of Fame leaders. But it's the everyday people that had the most influence on me because that's who I saw every day. 
and I know what I can be. We talk about this all the time. Is that people know what they can be by what they see, not what they hear. And I had some great people, great individuals, hardworking. Blue. I come from a blue collar family, and I had an opportunity every day watch Grandpa go to work, Grandma go to work, watch Mom go to work, and those were really leaders. And Grandpa always said, it doesn't matter what someone's done to you. The most important thing is how you respond. You can't control what, what people say to you, but what you control is how you, what you, how you respond. And that's a sign of leadership. I work with a great leader in, in, in Commissioner Goodell, great leader in, in uh, Robert Gulliver and Jeff Pash, some wonderful leaders at the National Football League, doing some phenomenal work. I get a chance to gleam and, 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 and share insight with these individuals on a daily basis. Great leadership. Well, and those those are some excellent names, uh, the, the public names that we were talking about there. And, again, from my life, I can attest to that. I think a lot of other people can, too. The, the, the lives of uh, people that are not widely known to society uh, that have a, a great impact on your life and uh, people that deserve to be uh, more widely known but are not. Somebody who maybe fits in the middle ground of that because he was a public figure but does not get the acclaim that I think he deserves. Somebody that I was a tremendous fan of, uh, when he was coaching, uh, your defensive coordinator there in Philadelphia, Jim Johnson. We had Nahani Jones on the show previously and asked him about uh, Jim Johnson. In my book, if they ever start letting coordinators, pure coordinators in the Hall of Fame, which I think they should look at for the elite ones, in my opinion, he certainly would be on that list there. So I, I have to imagine that that's a guy who uh, imprinted a tremendous amount on you and your time with the Eagles as well. Oh, no question. And what, the one thing I learned – um, from uh, from Jim, and we used to always give Jim a hard time, but, you know, Jim was fair. Coach, as a player, that's one of the most important things to you is you want a coach that you can trust and a coach that's fair. And Jim was direct. He understood how to use the talent that he had assembled, that Coach Reed and he had assembled. He was aggressive. And sometimes he got things out of us that we didn't know that was in us. And I, I, I say some of those things because there was times where I'm like, Coach, I can't do that. And he'll start licking his lips. He goes, yes, you can. And I was like, no, nah, I've never seen that done before. He said, but I know you can do it. And I said, okay, well, just kind of walk me through it. And it was things like that every single day, you know, on on, uh, on Sunday at the link. Come down to me at the end of the bench where I used to always sit right next to the Gatorade jug. And he would say, hey, TV, how you feel? I said, a little tired. I said, I'm going to rest this series. I need to rest this series, and then I need you because we're going to have to go after him this, uh, these, next, these, these next two periods. And the look that he gave me was a look of, we need you right now, and I need you right now, and we believe in you, and I'm going to make, I'm going to make the call, and I, know you're going to, and I know you're going to produce. To me, that was somebody believing in me. Not that I didn't believe in myself, but he's counting on me. And he wouldn't make this call if he didn't think I can get it done. Oh, that's tremendous. I, I'm so glad I asked you about him because, yeah, that's somebody that I've always been impressed with from afar. Unfortunately, he was taken from us uh, far too soon, but a uh, great uh, teacher and a great coach, as you just attested to again. So, uh, yeah, well, so many great influences on you, as, as we've attested to. And, and you know, clearly uh, anybody can tell from talking to you that, you have a lot of your own natural talent as far as leadership goes, just as, as much as how you had athletic talent uh, to be a five-time Pro Bowl cornerback. You, you really melded uh, the, the athleticism and the leadership together so much in the course of your life. Uh, is there anything that we haven't hit uh, sufficiently that we should, uh, Troy, in terms of your work with uh, NFL player engagement or anything well, else? Well, you know, I, I would say this. Uh, last week when I saw you, um, literally I was there most of the work last week myself, uh, you say you're a Dolphin fan. I had the opportunity and the pleasure uh, last week of working with my old teammate, my former teammate, Dan Marino, mm -hmm. um, who introduced me to AARP. And last week during Media Row, we introduced um, the NFL and player engagement in particular, our new partnership with AARP and Life Reimagined. Um, and what that is is our our daily challenge, we probably spend 70% of our time talking about transition, the transition of the athlete, whether it's in the sport or transitioning out. 
AARP has done a phenomenal job of allowing, and we, we what we've come to know, what research has told us is that transition is a universal experience that professional athletes and those of the general public alike will go through. It's a shared experience. And working with AARP, they provide us with some tools, provide our department, the National Football League, with tools, life maps, personal GPSs, develop customized transition uh, platforms for our former players to successfully transfer or transition into what we call their new normal. Um, So uh, I can't be more excited because of the work that I do. I'm so passionate and the love that I have for the athletes as they transition in, as they maintain themselves as, as, as players during their playing experience, and as they transition out. And how do we share in on that responsibility? And AARP and Life Reimagine allows us to do that. Very interesting. And I, I actually, uh, from, from what you're saying there, I actually have a last a follow-up question for you, Troy, and that being I've done a lot of reading over the last couple of months here. I don't know how much of this goes through uh, your office at uh, NFL Player Engagement, uh, but talk about uh, the WWE reaching out to uh, the NFL and having their eye on guys who I I think from what I've read, primarily guys who don't really get much of a jump in the NFL but are still very young looking to do something with their athleticism. They've got this wonderful new facility for developing people down in Orlando there. Is that anything that you've really dealt with much hands-on as far as – uh, possibly redirecting some folks over to there? I, I've not hands-on, but I'm very familiar, and we do actually recommend to many individuals, here's another opportunity. Here's another place for you. Here's another resource. So um, when they kind of, I think they contacted us maybe about two, about two years ago and began mm-hmm. having discussions and sending us over some material. So, once again, the resources exist for most athletes, and in particular the National Football League, there's an abundance of resources, but we have to share it on the responsibility of engaging. Absolutely, and I've been studying uh, the brochure that you've got, such as the uh, off-season uh, boot camp that's going on for players that are looking to get involved in broadcasting and some of the training opportunities there. So. Uh, clearly, it's uh, it seems to be every bit as proactive as it could be at this point in time from your office in terms of helping these guys so that they can get their feet, you know, really running from day one once they do find themselves in retirement. Yes, I mean we there's an abundance of of resources services. Um, we want to share in on that responsibility, but there's also the personal accountability aspect that sometimes the athlete. We we don't like talking about it, but now there's so much time in between the off season program. The our athletes have to take a personal and make a personal investment in themselves. Sport will end. Their your body has an expiration date. We're not asking you to go out and get part time jobs. We're just asking you to sow a seed in your own life. Take a little bit, of, a few days out throughout three or uh, five, four or five month off season. Just take a week out for yourself, your family, your wife, your significant other, and make a personal investment in what's next. What's my fifth quarter look like? And how do I prepare myself for that? Because it's coming. And typically, I get no warning. Absolutely. Could happen in a heartbeat. And, again, you are providing a a tremendous example, uh, Troy, with your your leadership as well as the professional counsel that you are giving to people uh, in this position. Uh, Again, we uh, pride ourselves on this show on having great conversations with folks. We knew that this one really would be. I've been looking forward to it uh, ever since I heard that this was going to be coming up. And, again, just a real pleasure, Troy. Love to have you back on the program as things are going along and developments are continuing out of your office. Thank you so much for your time today. No, thanks for having me. And I I hope that I I gave some insight to your your listening, your your, your fan base or your listeners. Um, Anything, anytime you, uh, you feel like a need to, if you don't have anybody else you want to talk to, you can always call me. <laughs> oh, we would do it for positive reasons, not negative ones, Troy. Uh, we, we'd love to have okay. you back on. I appreciate your time so much. Thank you very much, sir. No, thank you. Take care. Appreciate it. And thank yep. you all for tuning in, everybody, to FDH Lounge Mini Episode number 381. 
we bring the show to a close, we would like to extend our deepest gratitude to NBC, CBS, ABC, Fox, All Clear Channel Affiliates, TNT, TBS, USA, UPN, Deadspin.com, YouTube.com, YTMND.com, MySpace.com, various blogs, Fox News, CNN, CNBC, MSNBC, IamBoard.com, Billboard.com, Google.com, ESPN, ESPN2, ESPN News, ESPN Classic, NBA TV, NFL Network, Sports Time Ohio, Athlon Magazine, Comedy Central, Cartoon Network, The Boomerang Channel, QBC, BET, The Spice Channel, Steno Notebooks, Manwich, Paper Mate Office Supplies, Waitresses, Strippers, Bartenders, Garbage Men, Janitors, Microwave Popcorn, The Writers of The Office, Scrubs, Entourage, My Name is Earl, Oz, Metalocalypse and the Boondocks, Aquafina, and The Periodic Table of Elements. 